Well, I'd like to welcome each of you to our business leadership discussion today on the subject of conflict management. And I'm kind of excited to hear what Dan has to share with us today. But lest I forget, let me begin by mentioning that next month, our topic, Biblical Leadership Principle, is empowerment. And Lois Ratz, who's on our call here today, who runs her own leadership consulting ministry and business, will be sharing with us. And so I know Lois well. She serves with us on the CCBF board. I know she'll have a great presentation for us. But today we're looking at conflict management. So why don't we just begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the love that you bestow on each one of us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have of serving in various leadership roles across this nation. And Lord, as people are people, we recognize the conflicts that come up. And so Lord, as we deal with the subject of conflict management today, I pray that you would give us ears to hear that which we need to hear. That, Lord, there might be something said here today that would help to direct and redirect and even change our own lives. And so, Lord, we pray a special blessing on Dan as he shares now. And just pray you'll give him wisdom and insight as he shares what you've prepared in his heart. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I should mention to you a little bit about Dan. Uh, Dan grew up in India. The parents were missionaries. He went on to do his undergraduate studies in the U.S. and his master's degree in Israel and did a doctor of ministry at Asbury Seminary, where he studied on how transformed leaders are cultivated across North America. Previously, he served as a pastor in both associate and senior roles for nearly 27 years, Hillcrest Evangelical Missionary Church and Bethel Evangelical Missionary Church in Alberta. Dan was sharing with me that apparently the research says that if you're 40 plus, there's a good chance that you'll have reached your apex and you'll flatline in your second half of life. He decided not to join that statistic. So after completing his doctorate, he launched the Crest Leadership Center and program nearly 20 years ago. And he's passionate to help midlife adults and leaders get clarity so their second half is their best half. With hundreds of graduates, Crest has emerged as the premier life and leadership program for men and women in their mid years who want, to, who want their life to matter and to flourish. He'll be sharing a little bit more about that towards the end of his presentation. He's married to Anne and they have four adult children and they live in Three Hills, Alberta. As a hobby, Dan loves woodworking. So let's welcome Dan to the mm. presentation today. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Don. It's a privilege to be able to talk to Christian leaders across Canada. And this is our passion is to help people exactly like you. You're in the front lines. You're in where things matter. You're where uh, issues are being decided and being put forward. And you're passionate about what you're doing. And I'm uh, very glad to be able to, to talk to you about this very practical subject of conflict. Let me tell you how I'd like to do this webinar uh, for today. I'd rather it not just be a monologue. I'd, I'd like to hear from you, and I think you need to hear from each other. So I want to make this interactive. And the way I'll do it is that I'll present a piece, and then we'll, we'll pause for a question and response. And just be ready to turn your mic on and either make a, a, a comment or an observation uh, or a question. And we'll just take a few minutes to debrief what we just saw. And then I'll go to the next piece, present a little bit there. And then, again, we'll pause so that this can be an interactive uh, discussion together today. So let me begin uh, with this factor here, is that you want to lead, but you hate conflict. At least that sure was me. And um, I, I got into leadership, and you probably got into leadership because you're, you are passionate about the cause. And then conflict shows up. And it's it's just disconcerting that you you want to move ahead with your, your vision or your passion, and then you get kind of sidetracked with, with this. Like, how come like that? We don't want to see that happening. And yet it comes. So today, what I want to do is help us look at some of the myths that we might have around leadership and conflict. And I'll be asking you for some of the myths you've noticed. 
and also uh, help us to understand why some of your your normal conflict management skills don't work sometimes. You do what you think you should do, and it just gets worse. Like, what? what's that about? And I'll help you understand that there's at least five different levels of conflict and why, how that factors into this. And then we'll conclude with some biblical and practical tools that you can actually implement in dealing with conflict. So let's begin with our, some of our assumptions and some of the myths that we might have in our head about how conflict is. And especially, I'm going to be speaking to us as Christian leaders. Uh, because we are Christians, uh, we have uh, a, a little bit of a vulnerability to some misconceptions. So let's look at these myths that there might be around conflict. And the first one, it's a bit of a naive one, but maybe maybe you started out with this like I did, that Christians should get along, that we're brothers and sisters, so we should just get along like good brothers and sisters. And another one that I began my my leadership journey with was that if if I'm just nice enough, well, everybody will like me. And if I'm just pleasant, they'll be pleasant. Um, I found out that's not true, actually. <laughs> Maybe you found some of that, too. But here's another one. You know, I, I understood or thought that um, people like to be challenged with vision and you know a leader should have a you know let a great vision where we're going to go and we're going to do this we're going to do that and i thought people would like that well not everybody did that really baffled me why don't you like this beautiful vision i've got here <laughs> and when you get a little frustrated sometimes you feel like like this one look i'm the leader so look you just need to follow that's that's how this works, right? I'm the leader, you're the followers, I'm the boss, you're the employees, let's go. And we kind of say, well, then people should just go because that's how it works, right? Isn't that how it's supposed to be? And then another one that I had, I guess I should confess, these are my myths that I began with, and that is that if I just ignore conflict, it'll go away. And Every one of those proved false. And it just really baffled me, quite frankly, when I began my, my leadership journey. I was in a large enough church that there was a lot of people. So we're talking about, you know, a thousand people here. And, and um, I thought some of these things were, were true. And I discovered through the painful experience, they're not true. So I would like to ask you, as you think about this, uh, what are some of the myths that you've noticed? Um, for example, uh, what, it, what it is as far as your misconceptions. When you began your, your time of leadership, what did you notice um, was in your, your mind and maybe proved to be not true? So let's have some discussion back and forth here now. I think one myth that I've seen is that uh, reconciliation should follow forgiveness. It doesn't uh, necessarily work that way. <laughs> There's a good one. Yes. I'm going to write that one down. So uh, what's maybe what's one aspect of conflict that surprised you when you began to lead and conflict erupted? What, what surprised you? What was the underlying assumption? that proved mm -hmm. I'm not adding anything new Dan but I would definitely share personal experience in the last point that you had on your slide being okay. if you just avoid it or ignore it then yeah no way yeah so I I really feel that's a misconception that I I had for many years mm. but I definitely have changed my perspective on that Mm. And realize that I don't think conflict ever goes away if it's just left to fester. Yeah, it's actually amazing how long people remember conflict. It it can be years, even decades. 
Mm-hmm. And if it's not, if it's not dealt with, if they haven't found forgiveness or if, if it's not been dealt with uh, and they, they, they meet you, uh, you know, 10 years later, there's an emotional trigger right away. And it's almost like they were back to where they were 10 years ago. Or maybe you notice you're like that. You meet someone that you had a conflict with and you meet them 10 years later and boom, you're emotional, just like you were 10 years ago. We, we do need help with this, don't we? So Dan, I, I'm looking at the points that you've made and I certainly resonate with all of those um, mm. in terms of my own learning. And uh, I think early on uh, in, in my career, what came to me is that, oh, um, other people aren't actually like me, like they're different from me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So anything that I can, is anything that I assume that, uh, where I assume that other person is like me, I need to be careful about that because yeah. they're probably not. Um, and just kind of keeping that in mind over the years kind of has helped me out a fair amount, but there's a lot to learn about that. So like, what yeah. are the differences among people and uh, what, what do we want to pay attention to in terms of the process uh, when we are working with them? Yeah, that's a very good point because uh, everything to you is very clear, at least from your view. And when you present to someone else and they don't get it like how come they don't see this so obvious isn't it well not to them and so conflict can come out of that exactly Dan, so I, got, I, I, got, I got one um yeah is is that people lie <laughs> i didn't i don't think i expected that okay. the depth of lying the depth yeah. of deceiving the depth of deception is crazy just when there's conflict there's immediately someone trying to cover someone yeah. else's activity yeah boy and lying is in spades these days isn't it Whew. wow in fact tomorrow i'm doing a webinar on critical thinking the search for truth in the midst of lies so we're going to dive right into that question yeah i think i think along with that it's it's kind of telling you what you want to hear mm. you know you you share your vision and it's like, oh, yes, I come alongside that and I'm excited to be part of that. When in reality, not necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily the case. So it's kind of a, a, a misleading, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I, I'm challenged with that whole piece around vision, because if there's no vision, then well, we know what happens if you if you follow what the, what the scripture says. Right. So vision is necessary. Yep. So challenging people around <clears throat> vision is important, but often does lead to conflict because it may not be the way they think it should be done. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. One thing, one thing that I've noticed is that it doesn't surprise me as much anymore as it used to is how willing even Christians are to sacrifice relationships to win, to win an Oof. argument. Yeah. They'll throw somebody under the bus just to be able to walk away and say, I got what I wanted. I got what I needed. I got what I thought was right. And yeah. Not caring about the other person. We will talk about that one a little later today. Yes. Very good, Bob. They want, they, they, they want the desire to be right and win the argument can be very, very destructive. I think, uh, if I may, uh, is yeah. I think I resonated with your first statement about Christians should get along, yeah. and I think that we have this perception of what getting along means, mm -hmm. and conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. So it's 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 really going back to the basic: what is conflict, mm -hmm. and what is getting along? And I think getting along also means that we can have mature conversation to solve a problem in the mm. midst of conflict um very good uh know. there's a key word you said lydia mature conversations <laughs> that word is the is the qualifier and uh, research says uh, about 10 percent of people are able to do mature conversation in the midst of conflict about 10 percent. wow wow that's right it requires emotional maturity that many people have not grown into yet. Well, you're all 
leaders. So you do uh, understand that we do have myths around these things that can really get us into trouble. So let's delve into this to explain a little bit more like what's what's going on. Why, why does conflict come up with leadership? We've identified maybe a couple of these, but let me just put them on the screen here with you. And the fact is that people are passionate about the cause, and so they have opinions. So you're not the only one that's passionate about the cause. If you have a team with you, hopefully they're passionate about what you're doing. You would want that. And so if you invite people into your organization that are passionate about a cause, they are going to come with opinions. And that's where you begin to feel some of the friction. They love the cause, but they, th they see a different way to get to the goal. And the problem that we have as leaders is that, that we have to make decisions sometimes between opinions. And when that happens, uh, some will feel like they are losing. And they will take it personal, which reveals, quite frankly, their immaturity, uh, emotional immaturity. Um, even though they're adult physically, there are many people that are emotionally immature. And so to have a, a, you know, a passionate difference of opinion and to have a decision made and it's not yours requires emotional maturity to stay engaged. Not everybody does. And here is the other issue, is that when you do make a decision and you have a vision, you're implementing change. And while it, change is probably exciting for you, it's not exciting for everybody else. Because it makes a big difference whether you're initiating the change or whether the change is being initiated on you. There's a very different emotional journey that goes with that. And if we as leaders do not understand the emotional journey that goes with change and how to help people with that, uh, we will join the statistic that 75% of change initiatives fail. And yet, isn't vision important? Isn't that what we're trying to do? We have a preferred future that we can see and we want to go that way. 75% of those efforts fail. And they fail because the leaders do not understand these people dynamics that we're talking about today. And especially around the issue of change. We, in the, in the Crest program, we actually, in the master's piece, we do a deep dive on this one because leaders really mess up when it comes to trying to initiate change. And it's not simple. But here's another reason. Here's another reason why conflict comes up with leadership. And that is, there may be hidden agendas. And it might even be in you. Maybe in them. And sometimes these, these agendas are hidden because they're, they're subconscious. They're not even, maybe you're not even aware of, of, a, of a subconscious agenda. They're not aware. But when, when conflict comes up, it tends to surface what's underneath. And then you find out, oh, <laughs> there's, there's more going on here than just this decision we're trying to make together. And unfortunately, all of this comes with leadership. And you stepped into leadership because you are passionate. You wanted to make a difference. But then with that are these things. So we, we're going to have to deal and understand a little bit more about how to deal with this whole issue of conflict. And one of them that we have to do is we, we have to face it. In fact, we got to face it early or it gets harder. And most of us, uh, and I don't like conflict, and I don't know too many people that like conflict. They usually end up being judges or lawyers. They, they like it, make their money at that, but most of us are not there. And so I'm going to show you, though, uh, uh, when I hit conflict in, in my leadership journey, and it just sent me spinning, I did not understand this. I didn't understand people. Why are they acting like this? And why is there a personal attack against me? You know, I'm I'm just trying to do a vision here. Is I'm I'm not trying to be a bad guy in all this, but they're attacking me. Like, what's that about? 
And it really, it put me into a, a bit of a tailspin for a while. And it made me go to my knees and say, Lord, I need help with this. Uh, how, I don't understand this. And the Lord did send some help. He sent along a resource that had within it this understanding that there are different kinds of conflict. And if we don't understand the different kinds of conflict and the different ways to deal with it, then we will be blindsided when something comes along that is not what you're ready for. Now, I put this text up here. If you text the word conflict to that number, I'll send you the emails on this because this next di diagram is uh, got a lot of pieces to it. You're welcome to write as I'm going along, of course. But if you just want to get the PowerPoint with all the all the stuff in here, you're welcome to just order that. And it'll come automatically if you text that there. So let me talk about the different kinds of conflict that will come up. And here is the diagram. There are levels of conflict. And the tension goes up along with the temperature in the room, the emotional temperature in the room goes up the higher up this ladder you go. And what is helpful in understanding this is that as the, the levels of conflict escalate, the objective of the conflict changes and the communication style changes. So by understanding this, even in in the beginning introductory way that I'm going to show you here today, understanding just this, you will begin to be able to discern at what level of conflict are we working with here? What, what's happening? And you have to use different ways of dealing with this conflict, depending on the level. So let's just fill this chart in. At the very bottom are the simplest kinds of conflict. It's just a problem. Something's come up, and the objective now in sitting down with the person or the persons involved is that you want to find a solution. You want to collaborate, and it's everybody's wanting a win-win here. It's good. And you can tell that people are operating at this good level by the kind of communication that's going on. It's open. It's straightforward. It's focused on the issue. It's collaborative, it's not tense, and you, you sit down and you work it out. Wouldn't it be nice if all the problems were that easy? There's actually, a, it can get a little more difficult. When the problems are more than just that, they can become disagreements. And now the temperature and the, and the, and the, and the anxiety goes up a bit in the room. Because now you, you, you want to win-win, but you feel like you kind of have to protect yourself or your opinion a little bit because there's a, there's a bit of a disagreement here now. We're not just easily resolving something. There, there's a, there's a, a push back. And you can tell you're at this level. If the communication is a bit guarded, you can hear it. You can feel it in people. You can feel it in yourself. And maybe sarcasm starts to show up a little bit. but at least the facts are still intact. But you do feel the tension. But it can get more difficult than that. It can become a contest. And now, instead of win-win, uh, someone's going to lose here. And the objective for some in the, in the room will be to put their opponent in their place. And it's gonna. It's, it involves exerting some some coercion here that, that and it'll be evident in the in the way they pe people speak, and in the way maybe you have to be self aware. How are you speaking when it gets to be at this you know tough, and you'll find that the the communication at this level uh, is there's quite a bit of misunderstanding that happens because the emotions are so high, the 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 understanding and the listening goes down. And so there's misunderstanding, worse. And there's disrespect that shows up. And the facts are, are kind of fading away now because it's getting personal and someone's going to lose. And it, you can feel the tension in the room. But it gets worse. You can enter into this fight or flight mode where now it's not just win-lose, but someone wants to hurt the other person force them out 
get them out of the out of the picture eliminate them from being involved with this at all and when it gets to this level you'll hear accusations come out false testimony like lies passive aggressive behavior and people in the room will be either fighting or flighting meaning they just shut down and then there's actually a third one people there are some people who just freeze they don't know what to do with this so if you're in a group setting you'll likely have all three of those happening there'll be one maybe usually one that's fighting and there'll be a whole bunch that are just watching they're freezing and there'll be some people who are looking for the door and they want out of here they hate conflict so bad that when it gets to this i want to be out of there i want to go okay but there's one more level and we might call it war and this is where the objective is to destroy the opponent regardless of the cost and we see this happening in literal wars right now even in uh, ukraine uh, there is a, a desire desire to destroy and blow everything up doesn't matter what the cost gonna win this one and but the problem is no one wins there's destruction everywhere and the communication becomes hateful irrational and very personal so you can see that your and my normal communication or uh, conflict resolution matters that typically are down here you know we just want to be able to solve problems right here and maybe you know we can handle disagreements but when it gets past that when we start getting into this green level here most people don't know how to handle this in fact the the recommendation is don't try to handle this green level by yourself bring other people in because facts are fading away here and misunderstanding and disrespect is showing up you need some accountability by having someone else in the room someone else who is knowledgeable or helpful or, or respectable and can can moderate just their presence in the room moderates especially if they understand their role in being able to help here and so uh, the problem for many leaders is we feel like we should be able to handle our organization we should be able to handle the problems that are in it and when problems come up and they're not getting resolved we think well it's kind of a test of my leadership so i better you know put my effort into this and i better just put my put my fist down and say you know what um i'm the leader you're the employee um you better understand this or else you're out of here and so now you're exactly at the win lose you and if, if a person goes there you are participating at level three you're doing the win lose thing is it always wrong to have a, a, a win lose no it's not we'll talk about that in a little bit later but you can see how the way that you deal with this level of of problem solving down here is is not adequate when you get here and up into this yellow zone it it doesn't work and so that's what really blindsided me is because i thought if everybody is brothers and sisters and we're we act nicely all our problem solving should be at the at the first two levels and we should just sit down and work it out and then i came across uh, a variety of things that all came together and there was somebody in the group that decided it's time to point the finger right at the leader and they began at at level i think it was probably level four is the, the way it felt like to me three or four and it was beyond my skill set and if you don't call in help then uh it can actually really hurt the organization or, or really wound you and then the other thing that's that's uh really uh very unfortunate about this is that other people in the room who are witnessing let's say level three or level four happening in the room even these other people who are not involved with it they get wounded by it they just can't believe this is happening and they they will they will be emotionally wounded by the whole mess that's happening and so some of them will just say you know what i'm out of here i don't want to be around this and i'm out of here 
So, boy, you can see that as leaders, we have we have got to get a handle on this so that we can protect the people in our organization and we can protect the cause that we are, are working on here. So that's quite a bit, that chart right there. And I'm going to leave this chart up here. Let's let's have a discussion here around it. Um, do you recognize these levels of conflict in, in your in your experience? And have you actually experienced any of these higher levels? And uh, what? how did the leadership try to handle it? And uh, what, did, what did you learn from that? So I'll leave this chart up, but you go ahead and speak. Let's have a little discussion around it because this, this is a key piece. I can tell you that I've been involved in every level of this, uh, even in church leadership. Yeah. Uh, and one of the interesting aspects of this is people don't understand the biblical prescription for dealing with conflict and they try to handle it in a worldly way even bringing in outside resources to help uh, with huge leadership problems in a in a church if it's not done properly and if people yeah. don't buy into the process it just gets really ugly because we and and after after we have our discussion i will give you some suggestions on, on what we should do about this but let's let's hear from you have you have you seen this and what what did the leadership do to try and deal with it and what happened so i've been part of a uh, church transition this was in a previous church uh, where there was an older generation and a younger generation pretty common situation and um, the younger generation it was just time for younger people to take over the church hmm. um, but in the way that they did it they did not take into account how the older people would feel about it. Right. And um, they did not take the time to engage the older folks, uh, help them process their grief around losing the vision they had originally and having to transition to a new vision. Mm -hmm. uh, they did not understand any of those process dynamics. Right. And basically the church imploded. It's still here, but it's, it's, it really went through a very wounded phase. So, I mean, I, I really hate to see that happen. And when it comes right down to it, we are talking about emotional processes. Right. We, can, we can think that people are rational. And of course we are, but that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Right. <laughs> Everything else that happens is underneath the surface. Yep. So we need to get a handle on those types of dynamics. What are the emotions? Uh, what is the process for working through the emotions yep. um, around change? So change management is really yep. um, self-management, like helping people manage themselves throughout yes. the change process. Yeah. And the leader needs to understand that change journey and help people do it. Uh, first of all, they have to do it themselves, and then they have to help others do that journey. You're exactly right, Lois, that it's an emotional journey. Other people, what have you noticed? I was going to add, Dan, that when I see your chart and I see the the visual of the escalation. One of the things that I've noticed over the years is that, or come to understand, is oftentimes as you increase to the higher level, what that is reflective of is the extent to which the conflict is rooted in somebody's values mm -hmm. and how values really play uh, yes. a role in the level of conflict and and how sometimes it goes from one level to the higher level. And I, I have found that once I realized that, it is very valuable to, to see conflict in, in view of values, because if you can, it was kind of like what Lois was saying and the tip of the iceberg. And is it, if you can go beyond you know, the words and the accusations, and try to get to the root of the value that's being challenged, then sometimes that can really help to de-escalate the conflict. Yes. Yep, that's good. Very good point. I've also found that uh, reframing the conflict in terms that are important to the person who's um, verbally, ex you know, who's, who's verbally involved in, in a conflict uh, attack or whatever it is, um, really trying to look for the common ground so in other words what do, what is it about our vision that we hold in common um and can we can we work together from that basis there's there's those kinds of um 
dynamics that can be explored with people as long as you're still talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. So have others of you seen uh, conflict at these higher levels? Is it is it part of your experience? What are, what happened to the organizations when they hit these higher levels? Maybe hopefully a story or two of uh, how it worked well and they were able to come back. Anybody got one of those? I don't have one of those stories, but I agree with the others in watching or listening to you describe these various levels, how easy it is to slip and go up a level or two, yep. right? Yep. And how quickly you can escalate. And, and yes, um, we talk about church life, but yeah, business life, but so often in church life, people hold fast to certain positions, yep. rightly or wrongly. Um, yep. And like it, I think what Lois said too, it's a big part of it is change management, how you frame it or reframe it. But that moving from one level to the other is so easily done. Yeah. It's easy to go up. It takes insight to go down. And that's what leaders need to do. They need to learn and know how do you bring it down? Because as when the emotions are high, <clears throat> critical thinking stops for most people. <clears throat> well, let's talk about how we could begin to address this but i won't claim that this is this webinar is going to handle all of these questions but let me just say let's let's begin with this uh, you need to begin with self-awareness because if you as the leader need to become very aware of what is going on in you what are your values and how are you acting when you get under pressure and here's one is that how, you know, how do you view conflict you know, is conflict a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it feels bad, but it may not necessarily be bad, especially if you know how to handle it correctly. And then the, another piece of self-awareness is your automatic style. What do you what do you default to? And that takes a bit of reflection to think, okay, well, you know, how do I act under pressure? What what has been my um my default way of doing this and then the other thing that we need to become a self-aware of is even our personality because that shows up and when we get under pressure uh, these things become uh, more pronounced and so while you know under no pressure everybody gets along just fine under pressure personality really shows up and understanding yourself and how you're coming across is the first piece in handling the conflict. So here's a little chart on the five typical ways that, that we could say that we handle conflict. And here is where this chart is helpful to understand that there's two things that are happening simultaneously in a conflict. There is the relationship that you're dealing with. And so in this graph here, the relationship, for the further to the right, the more important the relationship. But there's also an issue. And so there's a there's a there's a matter that we're that we're conflicting for, and then the higher we go up, this the more important the issue is, and it's your conflict management style will be a a combination of those two factors. So let's talk about um, what they are. Let's just begin with one, one right here. We would call this avoiding. This is where. Uh, the, the relationship doesn't matter to you. The issue doesn't matter to you. You just don't need to be here. And it's actually an appropriate way to handle some conflicts. In fact, the book of Proverbs says, uh, don't, don't pull the ears of a, of a sleeping dog. <laughs> I, if, if I remember how that exactly goes. Anyway, the idea is don't just make trouble. There are some things you just need to leave. And avoiding conflict in some cases is maybe the right thing to do. But not always. There are times when it needs to be more than avoiding. And how about this one? Competing. Now, this is where the issue becomes really important and you don't, you know, the relationship is secondary. It's it's so important. The issue is so important that you uh, use a competing model and it doesn't matter that that relationships have to have to go because the issue is too important and it means that if some people can't agree on the issue and can't agree with it that there will be a breaking of relationship and 
there are some things in life that that actually happen like this. And then there's the opposite, and that would be what we call accommodating. And this is where the issue is not that important, but the relationship is very important. And so you accommodate the person. You, you value the relationship. You're willing to let the issue go because it's not important. You want to make sure the relationship stays, so you accommodate what, what they're bringing forward. And you're, you're willing to do that. Some problems actually need to be accommodated. Not everything needs to be a big competition. And then there's one that's, that's sort of halfway between, and it's called compromising, but, you know, that's a bit of a trigger word for a lot of Christians, because the idea that, of that word compromising can carry the idea that I am, I am giving up fundamental um, issues, fundamental beliefs. I'm accommodating, I'm compromising. So actually, uh, I would say maybe, maybe we should come up with a different uh, name there but maybe it should be give and take or something where you give a bit you don't get everything that you wanted but they give a little bit they don't get everything they wanted you compromise because the issue matters and the relationship matters you want to keep playing the game together and yeah you, you know you're willing to to relinquish part of what you thought so that you can continue doing your teamwork together and then there's this last one, wonderful, called collaboration, where the issue is important and the relationship is important, and you have figured out how to collaborate so that you actually come up with something that's better than either of you had. Now, that's the ideal. That's why you put a nice star there. And uh, in my cl my um, classes with uh, with adult leaders, uh, I used to ask, you know, what's what's your default style? And everybody says, oh, collaboration. But, you know, it's not true. It may be collaboration when there's no pressure and no tension. But if there's tension, if the issue is so important and it's got it's got consequences that come with it and the emotional side goes up. We find that people will default to something other than collaboration. And part of the self-awareness that you, as a leader, need to know is you think back to the times when there was a there was a more intense conflict around something. How did you show up? Which style, which of these five, do you find looking back? Do you find yourself going to when when leader when it it the the problem was not just a simple one at the bottom. It does, these styles don't matter that simple at the bottom, but when they get up a little bit higher and you're in the tension and you feel the tension and you're in the room, what's your default? What's the natural place you go to? And so I'd like to actually stop here and uh, and invite you to think about that. Let's have a discussion. And then again, you know, you can get the PowerPoint slide. You don't have to make all the text on this. So what... When you're under pressure, uh, what is what do you notice? And what can happen is that when you're not under pressure, you have a default style. When you're under pressure, it shifts. And maybe you can talk about that, or perhaps you can talk about how you have intentionally used a different style for a different problem. Well, so I was my default style is coaching because I've been, done that all my life. I, in that, what that means is you open a space by asking asking a question. So when emotions are high in the room, uh, it's good to figure out well, what's the best question I could ask right now to open some space. Now this is all great until it comes to your kids. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you, know, you get you have this conflict and the emotions are already high, you know. So I think, oh yeah, I, I'm such a good coach. I'll ask a question. Well, I either don't ask the question or ask the wrong question, or I absolutely do not ask a question. I just for I just state an opinion. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that's a really good distinction between like what is your natural style and then what is your um what is your response in situations of high tension? Yeah. We all have a natural default, but you can train yourself. To respond and that's what lois is talking about here you can you can choose a way to 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 purposely lean into when you feel conflict that's there but you know let's uh let's hear it from others too my natural style is avoidance i'm conflict averse for sure mm -hmm. uh, 
being an introvert, having to learn extroversion, and also having to learn how to move into one of these other styles, particularly um, collaboration. Of course, collaboration usually takes a lot longer and requires a great uh, deal more investment than a lot of people are willing to make in a particular yeah. conflict. Um, the other thing I found is that you know, the importance of the issue and the importance of the relationship are often a matter of perspective and people don't see things the same way. So trying to reconcile and create understanding about those, those uh, particular aspects of conflict is important too. Yes. How do you impress on somebody why something is so important to you? And how do you determine, you know, do I, how much do I invest in a relationship versus getting what I want? Very good. <clears throat> Yep. And as we mentioned a little earlier in the webinar, there are some people that when, when, it, when a competition arises, they want to be right. They want to win and they, they naturally just want to win. And so that would be the competing that under pressure, they compete because that's their natural tendency. And then there's others who just say, well, you know, let's just get along. So we avoid or accommodate. Where do you think, well, do you think Christians are on the whole spectrum here or is there a typical way we tend to go or what, what have you observed? Dan, we, uh, we did this, uh, we did a survey in a Christian ministry of 40 staff yeah, and 90% were accommodators. Yeah. So I'm a collaborator and I look aggressive and assertive and they did not like me. I'm supposed to be accommodating. So when the person says something, even though they're looking for opinions and ideas, they're actually not. They're looking yeah. for you to say, yes, you're right. Let's go do it your way. Yeah. So it's uh, that, so that's hard. Yes. So, so, so this goes back to your very, very first point that you talked about, the whole thing about leadership and vision and stuff like that. Yeah. You're not supposed to. You're you're supposed to accommodate. And mm. and that's and, you know, there's no there's no there is no conflict amongst Christians. Like, we all love each other and we sing kumbaya yeah. and stuff like that. That's what they 90% wow. out of the staff were accommodators. When they did their little survey test. Wow, interesting. So we as Christians don't know how to handle conflict very well, and that's why churches split because they don't understand how to have mature conversations. That word came up earlier, mature conversations. Because I would say yes to you that collaboration requires emotional maturity of the leader and of the participant, and not every like if ten percent are are able to collaborate. That's why ninety percent. Don't do this well. That's why it's messy. It's always and I, messy. And I also think a lot of times in organizations, which I've worked in both Christian organizations as well as in the private sector, a lot of a lot of decisions and relationship is driven by the compensation system, the mm. reward structure. So if the reward structure is so influential. It, it, it's not really a genuine way of building relationships sometimes. Yeah. And so, you know, we want to collaborate, but when there is a, there's really an issue, a conflict of interest with your own department, then it's very easy for us to fall back to the competition inside of things, whether you're in a Christian organizations or in a private sector, yeah. that's my, my experience personally. And I, I find myself over the years, I, I still find that I tend to, I was very avoidance in terms of conflict, but I have become a bit more either between the collaboration, at least the intents and, and the desire to collaborate. But I like to confront, not necessarily for debate perspective, but I want to get down to understand what is the issue. Yes. Can we just deal with it rationally? So yeah. that's that tends to be my default, but I find is it's not necessarily the case with many people. So, well, Lois's point of asking good questions is a very, very good way to help people express what matters to them, and if it's done in a way that that they're not going to be um, disciplined for having an opinion, that you're going to welcome that opinion, you're going to want to listen. So, the listening skills. And the good question skills really are very important when it comes to conflict. So let's keep going, I guess. I want to have a little bit more because the Bible does have something to tell us. 
In fact, this is one issue that Jesus talked about in, in detail. Most of his teaching were stories and maybe principles, but this was the one thing that he gave steps to, the only thing he gave steps to, really. And that is this Matthew 18 piece. If your brother sins or your sister sins, go point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, then you take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of one or of two or three witnesses. And if they still refuse to listen, well, then you tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to even the church, well, you treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Well, let's just parse that one out a little bit. How, how does that work? Jesus knew conflict well. He went through a ton of it. And here he is giving his people a, a very clear way to deal with conflict. So step one, is that you begin with one-to-one -one meeting. You start at the lowest level. You, you assume that they want to just work something out. And you begin with them in a one-to-one -one meeting, face-to-face. -face. Like, so don't send an email. Don't text them. You, you go talk to them. They need to see your body language. They need to know your spirit, that you want to listen, you want to hear. You want to, you're, you're endeavoring to start at the lowest level, which is this face-to-face. -face. You're trying to uh, clarify the issue, whatever it is that's at hand, and you're looking for reconciliation. And you really do want a win-win. So that's where Jesus says, start there. But Jesus is really good in his teaching. He says, not all people will actually do that. So if it doesn't happen, then he says, in step two, what you have to do is take one or two others along, or two or three along, to a different kind of meeting. And you can see how by having involving other people, now we're looking at level three here, level three and above. When you involve other people, it increases objectivity and accountability. But you're you're hoping here that with that, they can keep the the, the thing, the, the facts intact, and the resolution can still be win-win. So you can see that the, the, the intent of this second level is to make this win-win. But if it doesn't work, then you have to go to level three. And this is where you have to ask a person to go with you to the leaders. And when it says, tell it to the church, I think we have misunderstood that, where sometimes the people will get up like in a, in a Sunday morning and tell the whole church what you're going through. I, I don't think that's the right understanding. What tell, tell it to the people who are responsible for the whole church. So this we're talking about the leadership structures now, getting involved, the board. Ask some of them to come along and help you. And this is where uh, it might end up being more mediation, which is more like the, the uh, what we would call the compromise mode, mediating between the two positions, trying to help this to happen. But if that doesn't work, then the leadership who are responsible for the organization, whether it's a church or a business, they have to step in and they may have to arbitrate, which means a decision has to be made. And it, if the people involved are not willing to abide by the arbitration, then they may have to leave. And at this point, there's closure. The leadership has made a decision, and it needs to be ended and finished. So Jesus goes on, though, and says that sometimes even that doesn't work. So then you have to go to step four. And sometimes you have to move forward by subtraction. If it's not possible to resolve, Jesus says that sometimes it has to be something like um, treating them as a, a pagan or a tax leader. What, was, what does that mean? Well, in the context of his day, that would be you know, a pagan is someone who doesn't participate in your belief structures at all. They're in a completely different belief and world. And... They need to be in their world. They, they can't actually live in your world because you, you have the complete incompatibility. But you're still hoping that someday reconciliation may be possible because you're praying for the, the pagans and the tax collectors. Jesus said you pray for those. And that you hope that there would be a way that we could bring resolution. But what I love about Jesus' teaching is that he, he starts us with reconciliation, but he's honest to tell you that sometimes it doesn't work in reconciliation. Sometimes there is a parting of the ways. And that Jesus said, that's okay. Boy, that can help. Take us away from the guilt that we're feeling.
So let's discuss that. Um, when it comes to this matter of Jesus' teaching, and have you seen this in action? And has it been something that, that has worked for you? Well, there's a preliminary step to this process that you've talked about in Matthew 18, and that's described by Jesus in Matthew 7. It's, you've spoke of it before, the self-reflection piece of this, understanding what your role in a conflict is and getting, this, getting the log out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck out of your uh, adversary's eye. Um, and too often people bypass that entirely mm. and they just want to launch into fixing the other person. Very good point. So the self-awareness piece is really important here. Yeah. Well, Do you see organizations intentionally using using these steps? Have you have you seen that in action? Uh, I'm involved in a ministry that is aimed at uh, biblical conflict resolution. So we routinely follow these processes. Mm. Um, and there are professional organizations out there who are applying these principles, mm -hmm. to, usually to pretty difficult situations. But uh, now, having someone who's knowledgeable and can uh, coach you along through these things, as Lois said before, coaching somebody up in this process and helping them to understand that you know there are there there is a, a scriptural prescription for this that can help to make the process work so much better. Yeah, um, and just the fact that you're involving Jesus in it hopefully will soften hearts and open eyes and give people a desire to want to um, kind of, you know, use an alternative method that honors and pleases God. Yes. As well as brings to them some kind of resolution that's fair and keeps the relationships intact. And this idea of bringing others in to help is, is a, a wise piece that Jesus said here, because when you're in the conflict, your emotions are up are high because it matters to you and sometimes bringing an outside organization or an outside coach in who's not emotionally uh, invested in the whole situation they can bring objectivity and process that even you even though you know these steps even you would find uh, helpful so that it's not you uh, leading the whole process but you're willing to say we we need help here we want to deal with this before it really hurts and we're willing to be humble enough to say, let's get help. That's uh, that's just a beginning on what the, what this is all about here. And I want to just mention that uh, in, in our Crest Leadership Program, uh, we we do deal with conflict in, in, our, in our curriculum. We also, though, have what we call a deep dive. And that's a, it's a, it's a recording of, of more information on this where... We, we go into more detail. So if you're interested in knowing more about conflict management, you may want to take a look at this. And you need, and what we do in the deep dive is it will, will tell you and show you the, the complexity of communication and interpersonal relationship that can be so easily side, you know, fall to the side of conflict. If you understand the, how to communicate really well, you can actually eliminate quite a bit of the, the um, the conflict that can come up then you can all we'll talk about you know how people are triggered and how you're triggered and what happens what's going on inside when people get triggered on this uh, and then uh, today we talked about the levels of conflict so that's that's on the deep dive as well and then the surprising thing is that there there's a there's a deeper work that actually goes on in people when they're going through this which is which really redeems even very difficult stuff so that's what we call our deep dive and then uh, we also just want to point you to our website here. You can see crestleadership.ca. We actually offer for mature leaders, our, our specialty is people in the second half of life. We offer a diploma in leadership and even a master's degree. We help people work through the major themes of their life to get clarity so that you can, your second half of life can be your best half. And you can even get some certification through that. We love doing this with leaders. We've been doing it for 20 years. And uh, we do offer this to you. you. Feel free to contact me directly and also our website that's right there. Well, thank you, Dan. You've done a terrific job for us. We really appreciate that. You're welcome. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. And the thought that came to me was the more self-focused we are, the less likely we're to resolve a conflict. 
Mm. Whereas the more other focused we are, the more likely success will arise. Mm. So it's just a final thought. As we as we close the session, let me remind you that uh, whether you attend each of these BLDs, business leadership discussions, or not, if you register, simply register, following each presentation, we take the YouTube recording, the PowerPoints, and other valuable information, and send it to all of those people who registered and or participated. So that's just to be aware that each month, sometimes the scheduling doesn't work for you because of where you're located or your work uh, obligations. So uh, just to register anyways, and you'll be sure to receive all the information. Dan, I want to thank you so much for doing such an excellent job for us today. You're and welcome. I trust that if you have more in, in, interest in what Crest has to offer, that you'll certainly follow it up with Dan and take advantage of some of the programs they've got, which I know many people across the country have done so mm. in the past. So one final reminder in case you joined our call late, uh, next month, Lois Rats will be sharing the subject empowerment, a biblical leadership principle, how do we empower others? That's December 21st at 12 noon. Uh, I trust that if you're available, you'll join us. And then each month, the first Wednesday of each month, we have a 45 minute prayer session called Our Business in Prayer, the first Wednesday at 12 noon each month. So let's just uh, close in prayer. And I'm going to ask Lois if you'd mind closing in prayer for us. For sure. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you so much for the uh, insights that have been shared today. It's been a very powerful set of concepts and con constructions that help us to um, know how to name experiences that we have and how to think about them. Mm -hmm. And then that helps us to um, give, give us more tools for managing these processes. So we thank you so much for uh, this knowledge and wisdom that uh, Dan has shared. And we just pray for each person in the room that we will go away and uh, that we will be able to internalize this and see it at work as we're leading uh, in your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.